are back. We are live, and I'm here to say welcome to the most overrated, underappreciated, most viewed, underview podcast of all time. Welcome to the Prince of Fresh Air. I am, of course, your beloved, the most charismatic man in entertainment. We are back, and uh, it's good to you know be back for another episode. And uh, you know, Dwayne and Rock Johnson, I know you've been reaching out to me, but you know, first I gotta get through this episode with this next guest because you know when I heard a story and he reached out to me. I felt that this was such a great conversation to have. And, you know, right before I introduce him, I just want to say, you know, this podcast is all about comedy. It's all about laughter. It's all about having fun. But we have those important conversations. So I'm looking forward to this conversation because I don't just have a a regular person in front of me here. Um, You know, he's a standout lacrosse player. And, fun fact, he was selected in the 31st overall by the Arizona Sting in the 2005 NLL entry draft. He is a prominent uh, international model, mental health advocate, certified fitness coach, and content creator from Canada, but now lives in Texas. You know, he's been featured on multiple uh, magazines, uh, Men's Health, uh, Hugo Boss, Jockey, Media Magazine, and over 40 podcast uh, publications, but he's on the most charismatic experience, and uh, I'm looking forward to having him on the, com- uh, on the podcast, have an amazing conversation, and please help me introduce Jonathan Nizal. How you doing, man? Good, Percy. Thanks very much for having me, man. Nice. Uh, appreciate the intro. You know, I, I try. You know, I was going to I, I was gonna save this for now, but, uh, you know, I, I was looking at you know, your picture, and I thought, you know... He actually kind of looked like Tom Welling. I don't know. Have you ever got that before? Yeah, I've gotten that before. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this could be worse things, man. He's a handsome dude, so I'll take it. You know, I was thinking, too. Uh, um, Vincent, uh, let me see if I can get his name right. Vincent Denor, uh, Denorfrio. You know who I'm De- talking about, right? Vincent Denorfrio, yeah. Yeah. You look like him when he was younger. Yeah, I was going to say, not these days. Like, jeez, <laughs> man. Easy. <laughs> I'm like, like Yikes. Uh, where's the hang up button here? Leave studio. <laughs> yeah. A young Vincent D'Onofrio. Yeah. I haven't heard that before, but he's a great actor. The oh, old, yeah. uh, the old uh, law and order days back in the day. Yeah. Uh, amazing guy. I actually met him years ago, but uh, yeah, I was thinking Tom Welling for sure. Um, but uh, enough of the, the, uh, the celebrity comparisons because this is not about, you know, me, this is about you. So, you know, like I said, I heard your story. Um, and you know, shout out to your, your, your manager who was super f- professional and gave me as many details as I can about you. Um, you know, you've been open about, you know, your, your past and, you know, things you overcome to get to the point where you are today. But in order to get to the, the present, we have to go back to the past a little bit. So, you know, how was your, you know, your journey, you know, when you were, you know, doing lacrosse, when you was living in Canada and then you moved to Texas? How was life for you before uh, you found this new uh, transition to life? Yeah, that's a big question. I mean, it's 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 been a long time. I mean, um, how do you sum up like 21 years? And I don't know, man. Life's been life. You know, it's it's been it's just like like life for everybody, right? Lots of ups, lots of downs, lots of um, lots of tests and just trying to learn and grow and make mistakes and hopefully learn along the way and make more mistakes and make the same mistakes and then you know finally learn and yeah man it's it's wonderful i wouldn't take it back for anything um spent a lot of time with addiction problems um recovering alcoholic recovering drug addict Uh, i had a eating disorder for about eight years it all kind of started with and stemmed from the loss of my mom uh, very suddenly and very unexpectedly day of my 21st birthday. And yeah, man, just uh, learning how to live with and thrive, not just survive. Because for years I was just barely surviving and definitely not thriving. And uh, yeah, man, it's just, it's been, I mean, there's a lot of great, great times along the way. A lot of like not so great times, a lot of, a lot of great stories, a lot of some, uh, some PG, some not so PG, <laughs> but yeah, man, it's, uh, it's been, it's been quite a journey and it continues to be. Yeah. You know, a, a lot of people, and the reason why I want to have you on is, you know, I've had a lot of, you know, successful people in their own fields on this podcast. And I think it's important, even for me, 
you know, I think a lot of people look on the outside and they think, oh, you know, successful, you know, businessman. Uh, I know you, you do real estate as well. You know, you've had a successful journey. You've been on magazines. Uh, what could go wrong with this guy, you know? And I think stories like these are important because I think it humanizes you. And, you know, for me, I've had my own struggles too. And it took me a long time to get to that point to, you know, not that I'm not, I'm not that old, but, you know, I think you get to a point where you want to share your story because a lot of people judge you based on what they see, but not who you are as a person. So for you, when did that journey start for you to finally talk about those hard hitting things? Because fr quite frankly, a lot of people wouldn't do podcasts or, you know, talk about, you know, struggles they overcame. So how did you get to that point where you wanted to um, express that about, you know, your, jo uh, your journey? You know what? It's uh, it, it probably just came within like the last 15 months, like finally got to a place where I could talk about it. I started doing podcasts and stuff like that. Like I, I carried a lot of, a lot of shame and a lot of regret and stuff like that. And I've finally gotten to the place where I'm proud of the things that I've gone through. I'm proud of what I've, you know, what I've been and I wouldn't, I wouldn't change them for the world because they made me who I am today. And, but for the longest time, like I said, it was a lot of shame. There's a lot of hiding. There's a lot of like, like you said about people, you know, they'd see me. And then when I start talking about this stuff publicly, they'd be like, people that knew me in that time, like, man, we thought you had it all together. Like you're the international model. Like all the girls want to be like, it's just like best shape in the gym, like whatever. I'm like, and I would just, I just felt like I was broken inside. But to answer your question, um, about 15 months ago, I don't know how I came to this, but I finally like learned how to forgive myself. And I've been sober from drugs for over seven and a half years and sober from alcohol for 16 years. But for some reason, just like I got to the point where I forgive myself for the things that I've done and the paths that I've cho chosen that weren't necessarily the right paths, like addiction, you know, like alcoholism, that kind of stuff, because I was trying my best with what I had at the time. I was I was trying. So I can I can put that aside and say, OK, I forgive myself and I also forgive myself for the things that I have happened to me that I didn't bring upon myself, like my mom passing away and stuff like that and a few other things. So I've just learned to like let it go and not hold it over myself and be able to talk about it. And yeah, like I've said, I've, I've really come to a place where I'm much more comfortable and I've learned that uh, vulnerability is power and not shame as I thought it was for, you know, 15, 16, 20 years. Right. And there's nothing to be ashamed about. I think, you know, I was actually going to, you know, mention, you know, congrats to you for being 16 years old. But that, that, that's not an easy feat. And, Thanks, man. you know, a lot of people, you know, like for me, my outlook on addiction and stuff changed. You know, when I was in college, I worked up close and personal with people who was in rehab, uh, who was going through those withdrawals and, you know, just trying to figure out how can they better themselves. And I think a lot of people misjudge a lot of people about that and i think it's it's helpful to have someone like you on because people can see wow you can you know hit rock bottom and still climb to the top so uh i just want to dissect this a little bit because you know you're international model i'm an actor so we both have an experience in the entertainment industry mm -hmm. and of course you know it, it's, it's a hard industry um it sure is when you were you know when you got into modeling and stuff like that were you still um you know, in your, your using phase and did because, you know, a lot of people don't realize, but modeling, especially, you know, from the, the 1990s to the 2000, even the 2010 era, there was a lot of models coming out talking about, you know, uh, mental health, uh, eating disorders, uh, struggling with addiction because it's such a hard industry to, you know, continue to keep yourself in shape and look presentable. Did that uh, journey as, as lucrative or whatever the case may be it was do you think that that also played a, a big part in you know your I, like your, your your phase of you know going through using alcohol and stuff so I started modeling about a year after I got sober from alcohol and so I would that, that part of my life was done but <clears throat> excuse me it um, it definitely I, I did this anyway on my, on my own, but it definitely started to put like a, a plant the seed of body dysmorphia and that kind of stuff and the, the comparison to other people. And like, you know, when you start modeling internationally and hitting some of the big markets, it's like, you know, sink or swim and you're, you're competing against the best in the world. 
So it can do a lot of weird things to your mind. And like you said, it's a lot different now than it was 15 years ago, um, the modeling industry. And I'm still modeling to this day and love it and really, yeah, really enjoy it. But um, I think it, it was not so much the modeling, <clears throat> excuse me, that led me to those things. It was more so the untreated and the uneducated uh, view that I had with trauma. And like I said, dealing with my mom passing away and stuff like that and things just compounding. And that more so led me to, you know, drug addiction and stuff like that. It's just not knowing and not having the tools and, and that kind of stuff. I mean, don't get me wrong though. I mean, it's, you, you go to a, you go to a casting and you don't get the job. And you're, the first thing you think is what's wrong with me? Like what's wrong with me as a person? Like it's obviously, you know, this job is based on this and I didn't get the job. So there's something wrong with this. And you have to like learn how to separate that and understand that, you know, casting directors are going to choose people they choose for whatever reason, you know, it's not necessarily just you every time. And even, you know, even the top models in the world are probably not getting 75% of the jobs that they're, you know, put forward for. So the rest of us that are just doing our thing, like how can we expect to book a hundred percent of, you know, our jobs and stuff. So yeah, it's, uh, it's been quite a learning experience. Like you said, it's, it's changed a lot. Uh, it, it was a lot different, but yeah, it's, uh, it's been a wonderful, wonderful uh, experience. I mean, for overall, definitely. I, I wouldn't still be doing it if it wasn't an overall wonderful experience. Yeah. You know, one of the questions I, I like to ask, because I'm not too well versed. In <coughs> so I would like to ask you, you know, I talk, you know, a lot of times with other actors about, you know, how the industry has changed. Even to this day, it's always changing. So for you, when you got into it, how has it changed from when you started to, you know, now? Because, you know, back then, like I said, you know, it, it, it was pretty well known that you had to look a certain way to even just get in a room. And now we're seeing diversity. We've seen all different types of people uh, being involved in these conversations. So for you, how was that that transition like from now, uh, from then to now? How has the industry changed in your opinion? Man, it's changed so much. I mean, it's for better and worse. Um, eh, for better, I would say. Uh, it was it was like the Wild West when I first started. There was no Me Too movement. There was no whatever. Like you go on set and the stuff that was said to you and the things that people would try and do, like, you know, you wouldn't even believe. And people wouldn't get away with for a minute nowadays, but it was commonplace and it was just kind of swept under the rug or just, you know, assume that was the way it was going to be. So um, I'm glad that's changed. And yeah, there's a lot more diversity. I think there should be. The general population is much more diverse than, you know, um, for men, 5'11 to 6'4 and, you know, up to a 42 inch suit and all these like you know, things and, and uh, measurements and stuff we had to be in. So I'm glad to see the diversity and in, in that changing as well, where people are getting a lot more um, opportunities and being less um, forced to and stick to. For myself, like I can, I'll speak for myself. I was always told I'm six foot two, so I was right in the height size or the height range. And I just naturally build muscle easily. It's just part of my genetics, whatever. It's just, it is what it is. So I was always fighting building muscle and getting over like a 42, like a 42 suit and, right. you know, the eating disorder and all that kind of stuff. I was doing all kinds of stuff, just running like crazy and all, trying to burn off muscle. I finally got to the point where I was like, I just told my agency, like, look, I'm going to be like a 43, maybe 44 suit. Like I'm not, I don't want to be a bodybuilder. I'm never going to be a bodybuilder, but I'm just going to be who I am. And they're like, okay. And I've gotten more work and felt more comfortable in my own skin as a result. So I think it's, there's been a lot of changes, but it's good that it's cleaned up a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, you know, Harvey Weinstein's and stuff like that in the industry and like really held those people accountable. And I could even see it. I mean, like I said, I've been doing it for 15 years and still am doing it, but like being in major markets and going from like one year to the next to go see the same person. And the first experience being that like drastically different than the next experience, because somebody somewhere said something and, they smartened up and it was like, Oh, interesting. Like it's nice to not be talked to like that. But again, like I said, I've had a lot of wonderful experiences and I've met a lot of wonderful people and, but it has changed. It's changed a lot. Yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, a lot of people only just hear the dark stories about, 
the entertainment industry. And I, I think, uh, you know, one of the reasons why I want to ask you about that is because, you know, oftentimes, especially now in this current climate we are, we're trying to change the way how industries are working, right? And, you know, there was a period of time where people had to go through the eating disorders and sacrifice a lot of things to get to, you know, that, that career that they wanted. Uh, so for you, because it is a hard decision to make that, you know what, I'm going to stop the eating disorders. I'm going to stop starving myself or whatever the case may be I have to do to get those jobs. How did you finally get to that point where you're like, I'm not going to do that no more. And, you know, I'm going to continue just being myself because, quite frankly, in this industry, you could be yourself. But that doesn't mean people want you for, for yourself. Right. So how did you find that that place within you to say, you know what, this is where I'm going to start going and this is my main focus. And um, was that an easy choice or was that just something where one day you woke up and was like, nah, I'm going to do it. And, and that's the bottom line. It took time for sure. And it took growth along the way and understanding and to learn that and to be comfortable in my own skin, like I said. Um, I've always been a big proponent of health since I got out of the hospital with a really bad case of acute pancreatitis that stopped me from drinking. I've been very proactive with my health and always taken very good care. Even, even when I was, um, even when I was, you know, I always say I was like a functioning bulimic because I would eat my healthy breakfast, lunch, dinner, you know, do all that stuff and take my vitamins. And then it was only when I was alone with my thoughts and I had like, you know, stuff on my mind that I would be like, oh, I need something now to distract me. And I would go get like a hundred dollars worth of junk food and just like binge and purge and whatever. But I've always been big proponent of health, and it was it was that it was the health part. But yeah, it was it was a slow growth of that, and I would say it was exactly, it was exactly that it was growth. It, was, it took time, and it was, it was for me. And I talked to I've talked to a lot of addicts and stuff, and, and you talk about rock bottoms, and the final rock bottom usually isn't nearly as severe as the rock bottoms that we've experienced throughout our lives and throughout our addiction. Like I've hit lowest of the lows and I've had dozens of rock bottoms. Like it's not like I just hit rock bottom and I was like, Oh, okay. Now this is rock bottom. Like, nah, man, I've been lower and lower and lower than that. So it's, it's coming to terms with and deciding for yourself, okay, I'm done with this and I'm going to move past it and take, uh, take drastic steps to, to learn how to function without doing this, having this crutch or having this addiction or whatever it is. And for me, that was step was, was uh, therapy. You know, I, I decided I was finally going to go to therapy and learn how to be a sober functioning adult. The first time in my life at, at 35, I was like, this, this isn't working and I got to try something different. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's what it is. Yeah. You know, I, I actually, now that you mentioned it, I do want to go back a little bit to that because, you know, I think it's important for people to understand how you overcame that, right? And, you know, this is a, a, a passionate subject for me because, you know, I often hear a lot of people make jokes or they, they don't really appreciate, you know, or, 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 I, I would say, right, <coughs> people say, oh, you, do, you wanted to use drugs, that's your choice, or you wanted to use whatever, you know, alcohol, whatever uh, vice there is. Uh, that's your problem. But the problem is there are other people who, you know, go through traumatic experiences and they don't have, you know, someone to to go to or uh, a support system to be there for them, you know, in a time where they need. So, so the biggest thing for me, like I, my friend talked to me and my friend explained it, like put it in these terms and it was kind of right. Like the universe was showing me that each of the substances that I was addicted to weren't working out for me. I was having bad experiences with them all. And the final straw, I was uh, addicted to some muscle relaxers and they were over the counter muscle relaxers. You just buy them on the shelves and each pill contained 500 milligrams of methocarbamol. That's the active muscle releasing um, drug. And then 200 milligrams of ibuprofen in each pill. And it says, don't take more than 12 in one day. You know, that's the recommended on the box guidelines, whatever. So I had kind of, like I said, exhausted all these other, um, all these other addictions and I, but I still had all these feelings and all this trauma and stuff that I didn't want to deal with. So, you know, I took a few pills and I'm, I'm a big, like when I do things, I do it, like I go all in, like if I'm going to, if 
play lacrosse, I'm going to be a professional lacrosse player. If I drink, I'm going to be an alcoholic, like big time alcoholic. If I'm going to model, I want to go like the you know top uh, markets around the world, that kind of stuff. It's one of my best and worst qualities for sure. So it says don't take more than 12 in one day. And I was taking 100 pills every single day. I was taking 50,000 milligrams of methocarbamol and 20,000 milligrams of ibuprofen every single day. And I was just, that was just my way of coping. You know, I would just dump, I get home, I dump a handful of like 30 or 40 in my, in my hand and just swallow them down and then just kind of forget about my day. And finally it gave me an intestinal ulcer and I was seeing all kinds of, you know, I was losing weight. Um, you know, my anxiety was through the roof. I was like having fainting spells, like cracked my head open one day because I fainted in my house and woke up in a pool of blood. And that's when I said to myself, okay, I can either graduate. Cause I was always pretty good about staying on like the baseline drugs. Like I did a lot of them, like it really, really abused them. But I was like, okay, I can either add graduate to, you know, Coke or heroin or, you know, Oxy, whatever. But I know as soon as I do that, my life's over. Like, I know that I won't be able to come back from that. Or I can do something else drastic. And like I said, that was going to therapy. And man, it was hard because for the first time in my life, I was talking about and dealing with all this trauma that I've like dealt with and all these things that I've put off for the last 15 years. And I had to talk about and confront and like learn and, and really like dive into, like delve into them but I didn't have a substance or anything to fall back on. It was just me and my thoughts. But I always say, I grew up on a farm in Canada, a 500 acre cattle farm. And growing up at a farm, there's, there's a lot of work to do. Obviously it's, you know, farms are synonymous with, with having a lot of work to do. And like from a young age, I was instilled with a very diligent work ethic because when you're on the farm, you don't have a choice whether or not you want to do things. You know, it's, it's minus 40 and my dad was on a business trip because he owned a he owned his, uh, an architecture design firm as well it's minus 40 degrees and I, you know i'm the boy in the family and i got have to go put hay out it's like do i want to no but i do i have to yeah i gotta go out, out there for an hour hour and a half and do this so same thing with the summertime you know it's beautiful out all my friends are at their cottages or skateboarding and stuff that i wouldn't be doing but like we've got three days of doing hay or cleaning the barn to do like that's just the way it is. It's like, okay, let's, you know, roll up your sleeve and get to work. So I went with the same mentality as that to my mental health and finally like overcoming this stuff. I was like, is it going to be easy? No. Is it going to be hard? Hell yeah. Is it, am I going to let it beat me? No. Um, did I think it was going to beat me? Like, yeah, many, many, many times. But that same mentality where I just went at it and I worked with a, a therapist and finally gained the tools. That's a big thing is, is for me is the tools, you know, and in that I think it comes with time and also comes with um, it comes with, you know, some leadership, some guidance. And yeah, finally, finally got to that point where it was one way or the other. It was either, like I said, go on the street and become of, you know, just just call it a whatever and be a drug addict or go the opposite route. And I chose the opposite. Yeah. You know, I do want to ask you too about <clears throat> that transition, right? Because one of the things I wanted to, you know, mention, I've, I've been recently, I've been talking about, you know, my work, um, you know, in other areas outside of entertainment, because I feel like a lot of people don't really get to know me as a person. So I'll just say this, you know, you know, when I met, when I got to work, with um you know people who was in that situation that you were in um you know i took a uh, psych, uh, sociology class while i was in college so part of the class i had to go to a AA meeting you know and so because i had the connection with these people you know i, I ended up going to i ended, ended up attending a AA meeting with them and there was one guy in particular and you know i still talk to him once in a while uh but he was telling me how for him he made that change. You know, he lived in upstate New York in a certain area, and he knew that if he stayed in that area, he would not continue. Uh, he would continue doing what he was doing. So he ended up moving. and But the problem is he brought the same people that he lived in that area with with him. And he ended up, you know, being living in this house with a bunch of people who knew he was 
recovering, but you know they were offering him money to go buy alcohol, knowing that he was trying not to do it. And you know he ended up relapsing because his environment, even though he changed his environment, he didn't change his circle. And you know th- I think that does play a big part in you know the fact that how people can, you know everybody's different, obviously. But for you, did you have to make certain sacrifices or certain changes outside of therapy to get you to that point too? Yeah, I would say like when I stopped drinking, I lost a lot of my drinking friends and it's not because they're bad people or because, you know, I'm better than or whatever. It's just that's what we had in common. That was our common, you know, that's what that's what we did together. Same with lacrosse. When I stopped playing lacrosse, I, I lost a lot of my lacrosse buddies and people because that chapter of my life was was closed and that's what we had in common. You know, it's 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 just the ebbs and flows of you know, the seasons of life. But when it came to like the drugs and stuff like that, I was very insular and very like hidden. And I would just do it myself where I would just like, I'd go out, I'd go train my clients in the morning. I'd go to a shoot. I'd go to the gym. Everything looked like it was like, you know, perfect on the outside or whatever you want to think, whatever. People could just make their own assumptions. And I'd be like, you know, just smiling all great and good. And then I'd get home and then I would just like, you know, just get into it. Like, and that was very insular. But it's interesting you say that because I remember I was in the midst of my drug addiction and I didn't really talk about it with many people. And I told my dad once, I was like, I, th- I think I'm going to move. He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, I think I'm going to move somewhere else in Toronto. Like, just, I don't know, just change the scenery. He's like, look, I don't know what you're going through right now exactly. You know, you tell me as much as you want to tell me, but I don't know exactly what you're going through. But just know that wherever you go, your problems are going to follow you. Like, don't think that you're magically going to go somewhere else and, you know, it's going to just, it's going to just change like, like a magic. And it was true. And when I finally moved to Texas, I was in a place where I had grown and I was moving towards opportunity as opposed to running away from something. And I'm in a place, I've been in a place for a long time where I don't have, uh, you know, I, I've, the farther, I guess, I don't know, the more that, the more, the longer sobriety uh, the more sobriety that I incur, the longer it goes on, the less I want to ingest any kind of drugs or alcohol or anything like that. Like, I really enjoy being like waking up and feeling the same. I spent, you know, like I said, like 15 years of my life doing everything I could to alter my alter my state of consciousness, to, you know, be drunk, to be high, to, you know, drink too much caffeine, like to like anything, you know, women, whatever it was to alter my state of consciousness, like to distract me. And now I just like to be like, you know, everything just be like, kind of like, just feel balanced. And the highs feel that much better. Like when you're in that, like when you're like conscious and I'm not a preachy non-drinker, I'm not a preachy, like sober guy. I'm not saying that everybody should do it. Like, nah, man, forget that. Live your life, do what you want to do by all means. I'm just, I'm just sharing my story anecdotally. This is just what I've been through, you know, like, But for me, I found that the highs feel that much better and the lows feel that much lower. But you can't experience the highs at that height without feeling the lows that low because I lived in a gray area before where everything was just kind of like in here because I was always drunk or high or something. And the highs would be like, oh, that's great. And the lows would be like, oh, that sucks. Oh, that's great. Oh, that sucks. It was just like a very like a very gray place to live. And yeah, it's uh, like I said, like it got to a point where I was, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a dual citizen. And it was like it was time for a change. And it was and I was like, OK, I've done a lot of work to become, you know, uh, to grow and, and to get to where I'm at. And like I said, I'm going to move towards opportunity and not I'm not running from anything. You know, I'm, I'm moving towards. And that was a big thing because you're absolutely right. I mean, the people you surround yourself with, um, the situations that you put yourself in. I know that there are certain situations that I won't put myself in, not because I'm tempted to um use or anything like that i just don't want to be around it you know even people who are smoking like smoking weed socially like that's awesome like i mean like by all means you know have fun with it i just don't want to put my, myself in that situation because i just don't want to be around it and drinking's fine people can be drinking right next to me but you know i won't date somebody i won't date somebody who drinks because i don't want to have alcohol so you know somebody drinking in my house every day i have a bottle of champagne in my thing it's a, a souvenir from a ski trip back in the day uh, Don Perignon, but not a big deal, <laughs> but, but I have no, I have no desire to drink it because like I said, I've just, 
yeah, I, I don't want to, but yeah, it's, it's very true. I mean, who you surround yourself with, the situations that you put yourself in. Um, and one thing you said about going to AA, like I didn't go to AA right away. And that's probably, uh, I mean, the programs work differently for different people. Right. I took my own path and that's fine. And like I said before, I'm, I'm very happy and proud of the path that I took. But I did finally go to an AA meeting with a friend of mine. She had a, a sugar addiction. And we went to this AA meeting and it was in the back of a church, like in like this auditorium kind of thing. And there were hundreds of people there. And it gives you faith in humanity because you see, first of all, addiction and alcoholism and those kinds of things that you were saying before, like people are like, yeah, you made that choice. Sure. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't choose by race. It doesn't choose by tax bracket. It doesn't choose by job title. It doesn't like you see people driving in there in a Bentley and people riding on their bike and they are like, they're, they're dealing with the same affliction, you know, the exact same affliction. And I saw them handing out the chips and stuff and people are getting their 10 year chip. People are getting their, you know, five year chip, their one year, two week, one week. And then the people who, you know, haven't even gotten sober, but they want to start. And everybody supported and applauded every single one of those people the exact same. And it's like, man, this is, this is a really incredible thing to see. Like they're not making a bigger deal about the 10 year person as they are to the person who says, I want to stop, but I haven't been able to start yet. And they're like, you know, really coming together and genuinely there to support one another. It was really, really fantastic thing to say, to see and to, uh, to experience. And that's what I'd say to people before, you know, you judge and look at things and stuff, just be like, you don't know what people have been through. You don't know, you know, what has made gotten people to where they are and all that glitters is in gold and you know, all that stuff as well. But yeah, just don't be, don't be too hard on people and, and lead with grace. I think it's an important thing that I've, I've learned and I practice is, you know, uh, when I was miserable and I was an alcoholic, I wanted to bring everybody down to my, down to my level because misery loves company. It's, you know, and I didn't realize, I just thought that all these bad things happened around me and I had the worst luck, but I it was, it was me. It was, I was the nucleus. It was me putting it out. And now I'd rather lend a helping hand and continue to learn and grow because I don't think I know it all. I have, you know, lots of learning to do. The older I get, the more I realize I don't know. When I was 18, I had it all figured out. I was like, <laughs> you got a question? I got the answer. <laughs> Easy. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's lend a hand and don't be so quick to judge. I don't care if it's the person who, you know, cuts your lawn or delivers your food or you work for, owns the business you work for, whatever. Everybody deserves the same amount of respect, exact same amount of respect. I don't care what car you drive. I don't care how big your muscles are. I don't care how many zeros in your bank account. I don't care about your job title. I don't care about any of that stuff. I care about who you are as a person and how you treat other people. And that's it. And everybody gets my respect, like the same amount of respect from me. And now if you lose that respect, then, you know, I wish you the best, but you're not going to be part of my life anymore, you know, because... I've, I've learned and we're just not meant to go on, you know, but yeah, I'm a big proponent of that is, is, uh, never putting yourself above people and, and being, uh, reaching out and helping and, and just understanding people are going through things. That's beautifully said. And that's one of the reasons why I enjoy going to AA because it, 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 you know, that type of lifestyle, a lot of people, if you're not immediately impacted or you're not one of the people who are, you know, talking at those meetings, you don't really understand what's going on. You, I think a lot of people have judged people a little too harshly, and a lot of people don't even know why people got into that route, right? And mm -hmm. I think it's important for people not to judge because, well, I would say this. I think people judge the ones that is clearly obvious, but the ones that dress up in the suit, who drive the nice car, you know, people say, hey, you know, they got the money, why not? You know, so I think people do judge the ones that, they deem maybe like low in society, but not the ones that have the, the status and the wealth. Because a lot of times if you're, you know, not that I'm throwing this out there at Bill, but if Bill Gates was out there doing that, people wouldn't care because he's a billionaire, right? So um, I, I do want to ask you though, um, as you've gotten successful, you have your own, you know, business, you have your own brand, you know, I, I'm sure you've been in a situation where, you know, Hey, let's go discuss this business venture over dinner. Um, or, you know, friends, hey, you know, let's go out for a drink and stuff like that. Do you find yourself having to put boundaries, not just for your family, friends, and loved ones, but just for yourself in, in the sense that, you know, everybody's different. But I know some people will say, 
I'm, I will never go to a bar because if I see the alcohol, I'm going to be tempted. Or, um, I, like I know you mentioned earlier, I wouldn't, you know, date somebody who, who smokes weed and stuff like that. Do you find it very important to set those boundaries clear and don't allow people to kind of, you know, maneuver around it? For sure. I mean, I know, I know now what boundaries I have to with uh, uphold and, and what works and doesn't work for me. Like I don't go to bars, not because I'm tempted to drink just because it's not that much fun. <laughs> like yeah. drunk people are most are pretty annoying. And I was like the most annoying, you know, I was that guy, either I was everybody's best friend or wanted to fight somebody. Or I was like, let's go to Wendy's or I was like, I was just, or, you know, and, and I, it's, it's just not my scene. And, you know, I, I could easily go to a bar if I wanted to, like I said, and, and not drink. And every once in a while I'll go out with friends and, you know, they'll just be like, Hey, can you like come along and talk to girls for us? Cause we're, we're afraid to talk to girls. So I'm like, you guys are There's losers. always those guys, huh? Always. Yeah. Like we're just going to use you as bait. <laughs> and then you can just like <laughs> scoot off at the end of the night and whatever. I'm like, but, um, so I can be in that kind of situation for sure. And that doesn't bother me, but, yeah, like I said, like with regards to being around weed and that kind of stuff and other, um, somebody asked me like a year ago or two years ago, it's like a Sunday, I'm at the gym and this, uh, this couple was like, Hey, what are you doing this afternoon? I'm like nothing. It's just Sunday, probably watch some football or whatever. And they're like, Hey, do you want to come over and candy flip? And I'm like, how do you know what that means? And I guess it's taking mushrooms and LSD. I'm like, no what? <laughs> I'm like, no, I do not want to do that. <laughs> like that is, and it was just like as casual as it was like, Hey, nice day outside. eh?" like, <laughs> I was like, no, I don't want to. And I don't want to be around you guys when you're doing that. Cause that's just not my scene. And I don't know, probably be interesting to watch, but at the same time, I'm like, yeah, I'm not, I'm like just casually drop some LSD and some mushrooms and you know, whatever else in there on a Sunday afternoon. I'm like, Dude, I got a hockey game later. Like I'm not. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, there, there are certain boundaries and you, and I'm, and it's different for everybody, you know, like right. it's, it's different for everybody. And uh, it's in setting those boundaries and in understanding what your personal boundaries are and sticking to those and not wavering from them. And your boundaries will change as you go through recovery. Like I've, I've noticed that initially I, was around alcohol a lot that was fine because of the severity of the pancreatitis i had i didn't want to go through that again and then i found that i didn't want to be around it and now i can be around it and just like i said there's ebbs and flows and things change and and but i know there are those certain things that are like those are certain boundaries for myself and and the people that i get close with um i have friends who drink all the time and they're really good friends of mine that's uh, that's got nothing like nothing to do with me that's that's awesome like i said go live your life have fun it's just I'm not usually around when that's happening, and then we're just doing our friend stuff. Otherwise, yeah, I, I'll tell you this: when I when I was in LA, you know, people. When you told me that story, I was laughing because I've heard certain stories like that when I was living in LA, and it is mind blowing how like casual it is for a lot of people. And I, like, I don't judge, you know, I, I really don't because at the end of the day, everybody parties a different way. Uh, and I'm not talking about P. Diddy, for, <laughs> but uh, uh, <laughs> it's very different as we're finding out. <laughs> that is whoa, that's a whole other yeah, podcast. Yeah, Yikes. That's a whole other thing. That uh, is stay tuned for part two, right? Bananas, yeah, right. We'll uh, do some you, investigation and we'll get back to you guys. Let me, let me, you know, it, it, it's, it's crazy for me, you know, and the reason why I wanted to talk about the entertainment aspect, right, is because when I was living in LA, you know. I, I met a lot of actors. I met a lot of people who, you know, was in a mingle with celebrities and it was going out to these celebrity parties and whatever the case would be. And I, it, it just, like, I remember going to one and I was just using the bathroom. I had a beer. And I'm, 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 I'm using the bathroom. And some dude comes up to me. They go, yo, you, you want some cocaine? And I'm just like, the, the audacity in the middle of a public bathroom to do that. And I've realized that, you know, a lot of people, especially in entertainment, I'm not going to point out anybody names or anything, but I feel like partying and doing drugs is like synonymous with entertainment. For you being successful in modeling, maybe modeling is just a little different. 
but do you find yourself having to stay away from certain like functions and stuff because you know what that entails or is it for you like I just do my my job and I go home and I do my, my other stuff that I got going on and I just don't that doesn't even faith me at all so I know for a fact like it's a it's a stone cold fact I've been I've, I've been successful very successful in modeling and continue to be but I know for a stone cold fact that I would be exponentially more successful with whatever whatever you define as success as but resumes and booking those top jobs if I would have gone to the after parties and gone back to the owner of the agency's house and blown coke all night just like like I, there was a certain group that would do that and I even had I even had those moments where I was like man maybe I just I just do a little bit of coke and I was like I can't do that I'm like that's that's not who I am but sure enough, you know, those guys were booking this, 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 this job, you know, in different markets and stuff. And, and I was like, I, you know, I know, like I said, if I got into that circle and, you know, I'd go out to bars and go out and do all that kind of stuff and do the VIP thing. I drink water or Red Bull or whatever. When I was drinking caffeine at the time and it would be, like I said, and then it would be like two, two thirty, and it'd be like, you got a choice. You can either hop on the subway and go home or you can head over and, you know, just do whatever. And I had to choose that for myself. And that's very much a part of, I'm thankful for the morals and uh, values my parents instilled in me and the person that I decided that I wanted to be. Um, but yeah, it's, it's for sure. I mean, but there's also the other side of it too, where people get too wrapped up in that. Like you, you're modeling in a new industry, in a new, um, a new market. And yeah, like I said, it's every night there's a party. You got club promoters messaging you. There's free this, free that, you know, free VIP. And people just go off the rails with it. And then they get sent home because you can't show up and do your job. Like you've, you know, you are completely, so it goes different ways, but yeah, it's uh, again, to each their own. You know, I, I'm, I can, I can look myself in the mirror and say that I stuck to my guns and I am the person that I, you know, I, I person that I'm supposed to be. about fitness because you're a certified personal trainer mm -hmm. and you know, you know I, I make sure i work out you know i'm six four you know i, I make sure I, I stay looking good for camera uh but for you like being a, a fitness coach um how how is that for you you know because being a model on one hand you got to stay in shape but two you know just from a health standpoint it's always important to just you know keep your body um, you know, in shape and keep it, you know, training and keep it moving. Um, for you, um, has modeling changed the outlook on fitness or do you feel like your, your, your idea of fitness just carried over into modeling? It has changed my idea of fitness, but that's grown and evolved and it's changed since. Um, I am now a big believer in fitness is mind, body, spirit. I think you have to take care of all those things for, because for the longest time, I just took care of my body, my mind and spirit. I just like, forget it. There's that's what drugs are for, whatever. I can just work on the outside and then I'll be happy and then I'll ignore the inside and that doesn't work. I work out again, modeling is just a job title. You know, it's just, it's whatever. Like I tell my clients and stuff and I show them my pictures of what I look like before when I was an alcoholic and stuff like that. I work out to, for life. Modeling is just a byproduct of that. You know, I will never do anything again. This is for me personally, but people can do whatever they want. I will never put anything in my body, anything illegal or anything that will jeopardize my health to take a shortcut. I'd rather work years upon years to reach the goals and attain the, the goals and, and keep 
leveling up as opposed to taking a shortcut and, you know, stick this thing in, in your, you know, you know, take this needle or do this, whatever. I will never do that again, by all means, anybody do whatever they want. I'm not being preachy, but it's just for me and what I've been through with my internal health, with pancreatitis and, and drugs and stuff like that. I just, I won't do it, but I think, and this is just, this isn't a modeling thing. This is a life thing. It's be the best version of yourself and the most comfortable version of yourself that you can be. And knowing that in social media, in life, there are all these people out there that we can compare ourselves to and be like, whatever actor or whatever social media personality looks like this. So I need to, there's already that person out there. There's already that version of that person out there with their own genetics, with their own things and whatever. And like we said before, all that glitters is in gold, but be the best version of yourself. That's when I started booking the most jobs, when I stopped trying to emulate other people and be like other people, because there's already the, this, that, and the other guy. There's only one Jonathan Neisel, just, just one. And I can be the best version of, and it's, it's yeah, holding yourself accountable and, and working hard and stuff like that, but also not like, you know, give yourself a break every once in a while, like be lenient, but not too lenient, you know? If like the days where I feel like, so I play hockey. I love playing hockey. I'm from Canada, grew up playing hockey, been playing since I was like six years old. So I moved to Texas and there's actually a really good hockey scene down here. So I play on four teams, four nights a week. It's, you know, my hobby. It's a good way to get out. It's a good way to like when I first moved here, a good way to meet people. Cause like I said, I don't go to bars. I don't play video games. I'm not going to just like walk up to guys and be like, Hey, you want to be friends? <laughs> like, yeah, that's not the kind of, so I play hockey and, and it's, uh, you know, some days I'm sore and some days I'm, I really need to take a day off for my body. Other days I wake up and my head's kind of in a funk and mentally I'm like, I don't want to go there. And those are the days where I'm like, Oh, put your shoes on. We're going because those are the days when it's most important to go there where you can't let that like that anxiety that morning or that depression, whatever, that kind of just feeling down, we can't let that win where it's like, those are the most important days. I go, I feel better for it. I'm like, oh, okay, good. I'm not going to let that dictate, but I take every Saturday morning off of the gym, most Saturday mornings. Oh yeah, pretty much every, because I play hockey Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then Tuesdays. So Friday night, rest Saturday, or yeah, rest Saturday morning, play Saturday night, go to the gym Sunday morning, play Sunday night, so yeah, it's, it's important, but mentally make sure you hold yourself accountable and you'll discover wonderful things about yourself, the, what our bodies are capable of, what you are capable of as an individual. Um, it's, there's no better motivator than when somebody sees the, the growth and the transformation and transition in their body, whether it be physical or, you know, strength or whatever. And people are like, Oh, wow. And that lights a fire. Like that's better than any personal trainer yelling at you or any like buy this program or anything like that. When people just go in there, they're consistent and they start to see it. They're like, Oh yeah, here we go. And that's awesome. I love that. Yeah. I, I would just say, I disagree with one thing about, you know, not being yourself. Right. Because you know, look at Dwayne and Rock Johnson. He stole my moniker. You know, he's the most electrifying man. I'm the most charismatic man. Look how much money he's making. Uh, so, Dwayne, I, I want a piece of the check, you know? I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but what is your team, though, actually? You know, since you're in hockey, you know, I, I watch hockey. You know, I'm an Islanders fan, but and some people might call me a front runner. But I love, you know, I love Ovechkin. I love I love the Capitals, Tampa Bay. Uh, who, who's your team? Maple Leafs. I'm a Leafs fan from Toronto. Oh. Unfortunately, I know, I know every year it's disappointment. Um, yeah, I'm a Leafs fan through and through. I can't, you know, I, you know, I bleed blue. I, you know, every year's a little bit of disappointment, but it was really exciting to see the, like see Dallas do so well this year because being here and being in this atmosphere and stuff like that and like seeing the vibe in the city, especially now that the NBA playoffs, like finals are getting ready to start and Dallas is in that as well. Like I want to see Dallas do well because not, I'm not hopping in the bandwagon. I'm not, you know, I'll be a Leafs fan, but I love, I want to see my friends' teams do well. And I like being, I like to say, like the buzz going on in the city around me and stuff. So I was cheering for the stars after the Leafs went out, but I'll always be a Leafs fan. 
for, for know, better before, or worse, worse, worse. You know, but before we, we conclude this episode, you know, I, I'm going to need you to apologize because, you know, you got that, you got that guy, uh, John Tavares, and when he did the Islanders, was dirty. You know, I, I, I can't. Yeah, he spent so many years, though. He gave, like, so many years. I know, right? <laughs> he had to go back. I mean, it was, it was time to move on. And you guys got Barzell. And you guys got a great, like, pro, you guys are on your way up for sure. Leafs need to make up, make some real big changes. But the Islanders are, they're looking really good. Lou Lamorello as GM, they're they're doing some really good things. They're going to be a really really good team to, for the years to come. And Leafs could be as well if they start to shake some things up, which I think they are funny. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm just busting your chops. Like I, when I got into because my buddy got me into hockey, so his family is Islanders fan. So when I started watching it, that's when John Tavares. I, I heard about him and then he left. So I'm just I'm just mocking, you know, because I know a lot of people didn't like that, but. Um, yeah, you know, I, I'm actually curious what's going to happen during uh, the uh, offseason off because a lot of people think there's going to be some changes to the line. So, you know, For we sure. might see some veterans go. You know, we have Bo Horvat, so I, I can't complain that much. But to be honest with you, I, I, I haven't really watched the playoffs that much, mostly because, and I've been watching UFC stuff, but I, 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 am, I am, like, pretty shocked in a good way that the two teams that nobody really thought was going to enter the playoffs and be in the finals are actually doing it. Because for the yeah. last, what, eight years has been either the Capitals or the Lightning involved. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's nice to see that shake up. Um, Florida was there last year, which is, you know, they're a strong team and they knew they're going to be a big push. And it's good to see Edmonton finally, like with Connor McDavid. It's actually funny. I used to play lacrosse against uh, John Tavares' uncle, who's also named, he was named after so John Tavares. And, He's a bit older than I was, and when I was playing, I played defense and play against him and stuff like that. And it didn't matter how old he was; like if you gave him an extra shot, he would turn around and he would two hand you. And like he's the leading point scorer, or goal scorer of all the leagues that I played in and stuff like that. He had an incredible career. He's coaching now and stuff, but he was a no nonsense guy. And I used to fight a lot in lacrosse and stuff like that. Thankfully, I never fought him, but. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's interesting. It'll be interesting now. I'm now I want to see a Canadian team win the win the cup. Um, again, not hopping the bandwagon because I'll always be a Leafs fan. But it would just be it'd be great to see a Canadian team win the cup again. You know, it'd be if I had to choose between Florida and Edmonton, I'm definitely going with. I gotta, you know, back Edmonton, and I want to see that happen. But I just want to see a good series either way. Yeah, it's gonna be. I'm gonna definitely tune in uh, as we get towards the finals but yeah it's uh it's been an interesting year i, I do want to ask you real quick because I, I have to ask you you know as a canadian and as an nhl fan although he's not really canadian but alice ovechkin do you think he breaks the all-time scoring list or do you think that uh the capitals uh retire him before he, he gets the chance i was talking to my buddies about this in the locker room recently and my buddy is a caps fan as well and he was like, I don't think he's going to do it, man. Like, you know, he still put up 30 this year, but it was a hard 30. Like, as he gets older, I mean, he's been playing – he plays a very physical game. And, you know, it, he's been dominating and, and, you know, producing for so many years. I think he's a, a fantastic player. It's incredible what he's done for the game. It's going to be – I don't know. I really don't know if he's going to if he's going to do it or not. I mean, he's he's getting close, but – it still is. It's those those last few are the hardest because, like I said, he's been he's been playing a hard physical game for a long time. It's starting to catch up. Like it's really starting to catch up with them. And whether or not he can push through and get these, you know, get to the final, it'd be interesting to see. Like it'd be a, a crazy passing of the torch and and you know, amazing cap on his career. You know, obviously first ballot Hall of Famer, regardless, and and one of the greatest to ever do it. But yeah, I don't know. I, it'd be interesting to see. I'm, I'm, I, I love Wayne Gretzky. He's a national treasure, a Canadian national treasure, obviously. And uh, yeah, it'd be interesting, it'd be interesting to see. And I will say though, so they've retired number ninety nine in all of hockey. Nobody in the NHL can wear number ninety nine, right? Like that's just yeah. that's a, and as the way it should be. And they should have they should have retired Jordan's number. They should have retired twenty three. There's no way that anybody else should be wearing 23 after what Michael Jordan did. They should have put it up in the rafters and league-wide, you know, retired it. 
because of what he did and the pin, you know what I'm saying? Like, I've always like wondered that I'm like, I know he's a billionaire. I know he's like doing well, like all that stuff. And he's, you know, LeBron and Jordan thing, but I just feel like they should have like put his, his number like untouchable, like, you know, come do your own thing. Like Shaq did and Kobe did and like pick your own number and be your own player. That is a good point. I didn't even know about that. I mean, Jordan was before my time, so I didn't. I didn't really oh, watch him awesome. play. But is is Kobe's number retired? Not legal, I don't think. Uh, or that's a good, good question. I don't know. That's a good question. No, I don't think it is. I think it's retired for the Lakers, but I don't think yeah. it's retired. Yeah. Well, oh, it's for sure retired for the Lakers. But I'm saying what Jordan did and when he did it. I mean, I should have taken that number off. Like, you just that's it. There was only one Michael Jordan. You know, pick a new number. You know, like start to whatever the way that Wayne Gretzky, like number 99 is it's, you know, it, nobody else can ever wear that ever again. It's, I think it's the way it should be. I agree. You know, it, it's a, it's a tough one because yeah, yeah, I could see arguments for both people saying, well, you know, yeah, you know, he was so dominant what he's done for the sport, but you know, the sport moves on, but. Like like you said, Wayne Gretzky got his number retired. I don't know. I think they're just two different sports. Uh, and I, I, I guess when you make you know three hundred million for four years, you really don't care about your number at that point. So no, I know. You know who knows? And I'm sure he's making way more than that. But um, shoes alone, man, it's incredible. It's so easy too. Nike's like with this whole like retro thing and bringing out and stuff. It's like it's like shooting fish in a barrel. They're like, Oh, you mean all these like old styles that we have just sitting here, like already made people love this and want this stuff. It's like print. I mean, it's obviously printing money. Like they don't have to just design new shoes. They just keep putting out the same old shoes and just adding new twists to it. And it's like, man, it's just printing money. And then the whole, like whole sneaker, you know, sneakerhead industry and stuff like that. And yeah, it's, uh, I, I do want to actually, before I actually did, I do want to say, I, I, you know, because I, I love Ovechkin and I just don't know if he will break it mostly because he's he's almost 40. He's not that far, maybe a year or two. And, you know, as newer players come in, you know, they're not going to really, you know, they're going to respect him, but they're not going to respect him on the ice in the same way. No, of course oh, not. Okay. And people know what he's up to. It's like when you know Steph Curry. Now, granted, Steph Curry can still make those threes, but people know what the game plan is at that point. So I just wonder, will it get to the point where the Capitals is – because they're not going to keep paying him all that money when they have a cap that they can use for a, you know, a younger prospect. Yeah. So it's like, you know, unless Alex Ovechkin is willing to take a pay cut, I think it's going to get down to financially doesn't make sense to keep him if he doesn't break the record anytime soon. So – I don't know. I don't know. Um, It'd be a shame to see him in any other uniform than a than a Capitals uniform, and I think that he should retire a Capital, and I think he will oh, yeah. do that. And just you know, like you said, he's he's been out, but that's the ultimate form of respect is to not like you know tiptoe around somebody out there because of who they are. It's to play them hard and play them whatever. Like that's the ultimate form of respect, you know. And that's the sports mentality. It's like. Yeah, we're gonna play, you know, OV or, or Kobe or whoever. Like, you don't want to be that goalie that he scores the winning, like the the record breaking goal on or whatever. Or you don't want to be that defenseman that gets walked as he like, you know. And that's again, that's the ultimate form of respect from like athlete to athlete is to play them as hard as if they were Joe Smith off the bench. Like, you know, play them hard and play in and. and yeah, I think it's the way it should be. And I think that's where you, like most athletes look at it because, you know, if you want to be on the other side of that poster where you're like your face is getting and somebody's dunking on you, like nobody wants to be that guy. Like, you know. Yeah. All right. One more hockey question before I move on. So which one do you think is more significant? I might bosh a name. I think it's uh, Ovechkin's one-timer, you know, when he's in the corner and he, you know, he goes for the, the slap shot. Or do you think Nikita Kucherov's no shot goal? Which one do you think is more iconic? I mean, there was a meme recently of like the most terrifying stance in sports, and it's just OV just posted up there waiting at the at the faceoff dot on the power play, just waiting for that one timer to come over. So I think like they're revolutionary, like there are moves and goals and stuff that are like 
you know, one-offs and you get these young guys who are doing all kinds of cool things and stuff like that. And Cooch is like no shot shot. You know, that was, that's obviously a, a very, uh, you know, out of the box kind of thing. And it's very, but look at how many times Ovechkin's done that. Just post up on the power play. He's the right-handed shot on the left side and he just hammers it. And I mean, I think that's, I mean, it's tried and true. Like he's not, he's not a one trick pony. Like he's, he just keeps doing it and doing it and doing it. So yeah. I would say that. Yeah, I, you know, it's – I, I got to give it to Ovechkin because it's been out longer. He's been doing it longer, and, you know. But shout out to Kucherov. But I do want to ask you yeah. one uh, another thing just to switch gears a little bit back to fitness. There has been – I've been I've been critical in the fitness industry. And, you know, I, I'll be remiss to say I'm a hypocrite, right, because I'm one of those people that will record myself at the gym, you know, because, you know, I'm trying to inspire people. But, my, you know, for me, I bring my – whether I bring my tripod or I use equipment at the gym to record, I'm respectful of other people, right? But there is a rise. Uh, you know, shout out to Joey Swole. If you don't know, he's an Instagram creator, fitness guy, um, who – there's been a rise of the cameras in the gym. Uh, people recording themselves at the gym, and then people start in trouble because they're recording and they put it on the internet and you know all types of nonsense with that. How, what do you think about gym culture nowadays? Do you think that it's become toxic? Um, what, in your opinion, what do you see is wrong with the fitness industry now? Because there is a lot of criticism where whether it's you know the Liver King, you know using uh, performance enhancing. Um, you know, professional athletes being busted for steroids and, you know, just the, the, the no cameras in the gym, uh, stuff like that. Um, what do you think about the gym culture uh, right now? I mean, it's a huge question. I mean, I've spent tens of thousands of hours in gyms and working out and doing that kind of stuff. Fitness, like I said, has always been my passion. And I was thinking about it recently. I was like, I've spent a lot of time in gyms. Like, a lot of time I respect, you know, people want to record themselves, you know, I'll take videos every once in a while and just put it up. Um, but what I like about what Joey Swole, Joey Swole is doing is, you know, that remembering it's not, it's not your gym. If you set up a tripod or you set up a camera or something and somebody walks by, well, it's a public space and it's everybody's gym. And I always say to myself, I love everybody at the gym, whether it's your first day or it's your, 10,000th day. I love it all because everybody's in there and they're working on themselves for whatever reasons. We all have different reasons and stuff, but they're in there doing something about it and, you know, taking the bull by the horns. Um, again, people can do what they want with regards to performance enhancing drugs and stuff like that. I think that it gets a bit murky when people are faking like Photoshopping or pretending to be natural and trying to sell something um and bold face lying to people and you know there have been a lot of those influencers and people who are selling programs and um yeah just lying about their own you know personal stuff i think that's that's you know kind of a shitty thing to do that's just not really that's not a cool thing to do but again people have to you know do as they want i love good gym etiquette and i i love when people put their weights back where they're supposed to be I love when, you know, people are polite and are you using this, are you using that, that kind of stuff. And it's like, yeah, let's all just have fun. Let's all do our stuff. And, you know, like I said, not <clears throat> just because your booty sticks out to like here doesn't mean that it's bigger. You're better than somebody who sticks out to there. Like, whatever, man. Like, it's just, let's just all go in there and do our things and try and be the best version of ourselves. And, yeah, gym culture is always going to be kind of weird. Um, yeah, I've seen, I've seen a lot of things. And... <clears throat> Yeah, done a lot of things, and it's just a weird, it's a weird culture. But you know, I think like anything else, it, it changes with society, and it's got its, uh, it's got its ups and downs. You don't skip leg day, do you? I do because so I because I play hockey four times a week, oh, and I have very muscular defined legs. Like my calves are like I just it's a genetic thing. So if I work legs. I will get to the, I will very, very quickly get to the point where I won't fit clothes when I go to modeling shoots as it is. My legs are too muscular as it is like just from playing hockey four times a week. So I can't work them on top of that because my legs will grow exponentially very quickly. And if I go to a casting and I don't fit in the clothes, they're going to call the next guy whose legs do fit. So 
my agency knows my legs are muscular. They are, you know, very well defined, you know, everything, whatever, but I can't work them extra because like I said, it'll just be too much. And I don't want to, like I said, I'm getting, I'm on the ice. I'm working my legs four times a week for an hour and a half doing high intensity interval, you know, sprints and training and all that kind of stuff and edge work and all that stuff at hockey. Like, I mean, in the gym, do I do leg day? No, but I would be remit. I'd, I'd put it up against anybody at the gym who does leg day, come out and do what I do on the ice and see if you can keep up with that as far as your legs. No, I, I agree. I, I'm not one of those people. I don't really, I don't do a leg day workout. I don't do chest and back. Everybody's workout is different. I, I do more of like a full body cross type of thing. And that's why for me, I record videos is because my videos are, it's not unorthodox in the fitness world, but when you see what goes viral on Instagram, it's usually, uh, you know, granted women, you know, we all know why, but it's usually people doing like stationary moves, like bicep curls, whatever the case may be. So my work is a more designed for people to, you know, be active, right? Um, do you feel like the fitness, oh, actually, let me, let me change this question. Do you feel like your profession is gets targeted in a wrong way because of you see these influencers building a coaching uh, business or, or a program, and lo and behold, they're 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 editing their photos for Instagram. They're they're cheating behind the scenes. Um, do you feel like because of the negative rap the fitness industry gets that people like you, certified personal trainers, find it hard? Um, maybe not you specifically. Uh, but do you feel like personal trainers get a – people look at them a little more side-eyed than they would if, the, if there was a better light on the fitness industry? A little bit. I feel like it's always been kind of like a gray, kind of like shady, like used car, car salesman area where he, there was a, there are those people who are going to be like that, and there always will be those people. But people like myself who are genuine, who – you know, people – <clears throat> excuse me, when I first work with clients, they hear personal trader model, all kind of stuff. So their defenses get up and they're like, Oh geez, I can't, this guy's probably never had a bad day in his life. He probably, you know, came out of the womb with abs from here to here. And it's like, no, I'm, uh, this is what I looked like when I was an alcoholic and I understand and, and I can empathize and genuinely uh, have been in your shoes and people's defenses are much quickly lowered and they're more likely to, uh, to work and to be more comfortable. And I always say too, that I want the style of training that I do. I want to pass on my knowledge to my clients to the point in which I become obsolete as a trainer, where I've now passed along the knowledge and explained to you why you do things and the, not just the movement, but the, the knowledge behind the why, the why behind that. And I want to pass that along. And I want one day for you to say, Hey, I don't think we need to work out anymore. And I'm like, awesome. Yeah, we don't go, go fly, man. Like learn some new stuff. Come teach me that kind of stuff. So that's just the way I look at it. And I think, yeah, they're always going to be those personal trainers who they're always there. That's just people in general. I mean, there are those models there are people at work we are nine to five. I mean, there are also people, those people in general who are, you know, lawyers get a bad rap, you know, because there are a lot of sleazy lawyers and it's like, there are a lot of good lawyers too. And, you know, you name the industry. There are a lot of like sleaze balls or, you know, girls and guys and, there are a lot of good people too. And I think, yeah, I think uh, karma and the world kind of takes care of that kind of stuff. When it comes to, you know, we were talking about modeling and like how the industry's changed, body diversity, inclusion, all that. We're seeing that now in fitness. And I will say, I, I will give credit, you know, I, I've been critical in the fitness industry, not because of like people like you or the people who actually, you know, work in <coughs> The, the people you see who gets the spotlight, the people who are obviously just using this as a platform to make money, and they don't really care about giving people actual results. They care about getting clients so they make money, right? But I do see now when I go to gyms, you don't see the one size fits all anymore. You don't just see the girl with the washboard abs or the, the dude who looked like he just walked out of a Thor movie. You're seeing, you know, some personal trainers out there who, you know, could they work on they 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 chest or whatever a little more? Absolutely, but they they're athletic. They look the part. They may not be ripped like Thor, but they look like someone who enjoys fitness. Do you feel like as a personal trainer, it's important for 
the the trainer to look the part, or do you think that there needs to be some diversity? Because if everybody just sees everybody and every personal trainer will watch more abs, they kind of feel like what, nobody looks like me in here. Um, how do you feel about that approach? I think that you should practice what you preach. And if you pre preach health, then, you know, be healthy. And health looks like a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Body shapes, body sizes, all that kind of stuff. I think that's an important thing that I think with regards to modeling as well. Back in the 90s, they decided they were going to stop working with anorexic models and, and um, glamorizing these models who are obviously hurting themselves in order to attain this figure that was being rewarded. And they said, okay, we're going to stop booking these models because we're not going to promote this. I think that's a similar thing. I think on the other side where it should be, you know, people who are hurting themselves by being overweight or stuff like that, that shouldn't be glamorized, but that's a whole different topic for other people. Right. I just think health looks a lot differently for a lot of people. It doesn't, like you said, doesn't, there's not one size fit all fits all. Everybody's got abs and stuff like that. But I think you should practice what you preach. You know, it's like, um, but again, nobody's perfect. You know, like I, 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 a big thing I always say to my clients is there's no, like, don't use the word cheat. There's no such thing as a cheat day. Like I used to tell myself that all the time, like cheat this, cheat that. But I've came to, I've come to realize, like, just live your life. If you want to eat something or indulge or whatever, have something, have it. If the word, the moment you say cheat day, you are mentally, you're telling yourself you're doing something wrong. So are you going to really enjoy what you're doing and what you're eating or what you're indulging in? It's like, no, because you're putting a negative connotation towards it. Just live your life. And it's like, okay, maybe you don't go to McDonald's every single day, three times a day. But, you know, if you want to go do whatever or get whatever, just, just live your life. Just don't put that negative connotation. And that's how I live my life too. I, I eat extremely healthy. I enjoy what I eat. Um, but yeah, I just, like I said, I, I don't think, I think it's important to that. And I think the most important thing is just practice what you preach, but I don't think, uh, no, I don't think it's a certain look. I don't think it's a certain, whatever. I like the diversity of that. And I think I've, <clears throat> I've worked with and seen a lot of personal trainers that are, you know, very different shapes and sizes and, you know, their knowledge uh, is through the roof and, you know, what they can teach people and stuff like that. And yeah, I don't think that really, that really matters. I think just practice what you preach if, and you know, like liver King and like the rock and stuff like that. And like, you know, yeah, we're natural. It's like, yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Come on, come on, Jonathan. You can't be talking about the rock. Dude, like that. That, that, that's my uncle, man. No. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's so obvious. It's not even a thing, but <laughs> Hey, but you know what? He's not trying to sell anybody anything. I mean, he's, you know, he is what he is. He's a caricature. He's, he's a, He's extremely successful. I think it's it's fantastic what he's doing. I think like I wish him like all the best and all that kind of stuff. And and you know do as do as you please. But it's just you know I guess more so like Liver King where he's like nope never taking everything you know buy my program eat raw liver you know that kind of stuff. And then he's spending twelve grand a month in just in uh, HGH or something like you know something crazy like that. But yeah, do as you please. Practice what you preach. I'm gonna I'm call the rock right now, man. No. <laughs> call him. Put him on. I got his number. <laughs> Speed. That's three way right now. Call him. I told him. I told him right to his face. <laughs> I'm scared. Be the last model and job you get if you do that. <laughs> yeah, right. Black oh, no. like. Nah, whoops. I'm just playing. Nah, I, I, I love the rock, but it, it, I, I've had this conversation. Like people, you know, I think people just don't want to believe it. But it's like, come on. Even like I, I'm not trying to downplay him, you know. Obviously, we we got the little beef with the the most charismatic, you know, thing going on. But come on, you can't tell me someone in their fifties look better than they did when they were in their twenties, especially at that size. Like, there's no way you gain that much muscle, you look that much better than you did when you was 25 or 30, like that. But anyway, that that's besides the point. No. Um, it it you know fitness. I, I enjoy it and you know I, I get to meet a lot of people um, including you you know who are very passionate about fitness and I think it's unfortunate you know one of my favorite channels is you know I'm sure you know Jeff Cavalier athlete next um, you know and even him like for, for a guy who, who 
does a pretty good job of not stand anybody to one specific thing. Um, people always criticize him, and I think the problem is social media has allowed so many people to have their voice be heard that it can it, it dilutes fitness, right? And I feel like you know this old adage saying, and I'm sure you you've said this and heard this: abs aren't made in the gym; they're made in the kitchen, right? And of course. We it's gotten so bad that you have people who feel like you can out train a bad diet. Like I like this is a certain creator creator I see on Instagram. You know, it, I will give them credit; they work out hard. But I I obviously know they don't live the life that they're trying to portray on social media. Meaning, you know, you see them going to fast food all the time. They eating cheeseburgers. Uh, you know, The Rock, you know, his cheat meals. You know, people think they eat like this all the time. No, they don't. You know, they eat, you know, a, a healthy lifestyle. And then when they record videos, I'm sure they a lot they allocate calories for that. So, you know, I, I, I feel like social media has ruined fitness. I mean, it, in, in one aspect, it has allowed different voices to be heard, right? And it has allowed people who are knowledgeable and who are passionate about fitness to, to reach new people. But the people who are going viral aren't exactly those type of people always. It's usually the ones that look like someone straight out of a movie, you know, who has the abs, you know, have the, 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 the jawline that, you know, the Rock Johnson wants to get like I have. But anyway, um, uh, do you feel like we will get to the point where fitness can – not just be about a business, but really about having people? Or do you think uh, uh, having people, you know, better themselves? Or do you think that it's kind of long gone in that aspect? I don't think social media has ruined fitness. I think social media has just changed fitness, like it's changed the world um, in every aspect. You know, it's, it's, it's ever changing, ever evolving. Um, with regards to who goes viral and not and stuff, it's... You don't you don't know the algorithms and stuff like that we can't really guess what the next big thing is going to be or who is going to be the next whatever for whatever reason and stuff like that i would hope that you know people are doing things for the right reasons and looking at one another you know through a empathetic you know leading with grace lens but is that the reality of society and the fact of the matter no it's it's not going to be the majority of the time but that's societally that's been since you know the dawn of time that's been since the 30s 40s like before social media that was always still a thing people judge based on you know if they judge a book by its cover or you know whatever they're quick to judge and i think that's never going to change um i think social media is just changing the world in general uh for for all aspects of us and, and the way we interact and, and view things and intake information and you know, that includes fitness and stuff like that. I think we'll just have to just have to wait and see. I mean, if you can predict the future, give me some lot of numbers. <laughs> but, you know, I think uh, I think we're all just kind of in the wait and see and hope for the best. You know, I, I have a lot of uh, faith in humanity and, and hope that um, people are doing things for the right reasons. And, yeah, I mean, we'll just have to wait and see. Just all we can do is do our part. And we can only just do our, our you know, be the best version of ourselves whatever that means and put that out in the world and then kind of let everybody else do their own thing because that's their right and their privilege. And the, what makes the world a beautiful place is the fact that everybody doesn't wear blue tank tops and had, you know, do their hair like you. I mean, the fact that we have these different tastes and styles and stuff is what makes the world, but you know, a beautiful place. So we'll see. No, you're right. You know, and I tell Dwayne all the time, you can't look like this buddy. No, nah, but, uh, uh, <laughs> anyway, you know, I, this is not about me. Um, you know, Jonathan, I, I've had you on for a while. You know, I know you're a busy man, but is, is there anything, you know, going on for you right now? Like, do you have anything in the works? Do you have anything that you you want to share um, that's coming up? Do you have anything you know, behind the scenes that you got cooking up? I do, actually. I'm uh, just finalizing the details on uh, being brought on as a co-host and probably – partner of um i think it's the number four podcast for uh, health and fitness on spotify and like one of the top 10 podcasts on apple podcasts um for health and fitness so i've 
already be doing some, we haven't officially released it and done the uh, press releases and stuff like that, but um, yeah, I'll be doing that and excited to do that. I've, you know, I've been doing podcasts for nine months and I wanted to start my own podcast. And then, you know, I went on this podcast and they, you know, asked me to host some episodes and now they're asking me to come on as a, a co-host, full-time co-host. And it's, uh, it's kind of cool to, you know, jump up to a, a podcast that is of that, um, of that level and stuff like that. But no, I'm just going to keep doing podcasts. You know, I love working with people and, and just meeting people like yourself. I think what you're doing is fantastic. You know, keep doing it, keep being you. Um, I'm just going to, you know, I'll be here modeling and, and working to keep a roof over my dog Bailey's head, Bailey's head. Yeah, I know. Your dog was trying to bark over the most charismatic man. What, what's going on? No, I'm, I'm just playing. Lovely dog. Uh, but I, I'm curious real quick. Have you ever thought about going into acting? Like maybe just. I've thought about it. And like I always say whenever I was in a city, whenever, whenever I was like, you know, traveling and stuff for modeling and in a different city, I instead of going to acting classes and stuff like that, I was in the gym and I had that passion for fitness and you know, I've done commercials and like, you know, minor speaking role, like a couple sentences here and there or whatever, but, um, something I've become more curious about, but in my past and along the way, I've always been much more fitness focused and yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, see what the future, see what the future holds, but, uh, definitely not opposed to it. Yeah. So if you ever get the opportunity, just let them know, you know, me and, you know, you'll get the role, but uh. <laughs> then I'll get blacklisted. They're like, oh, you know, oh, pff, yeah, you never work in this town again. Yeah, yeah, right. They're like, what? Never heard of him. It. Nope. Uh uh-uh. uh. Yeah. Hey, you said it. Did, were you on this podcast? Nope. <laughs> Delete it. <laughs> never. Nope. All right, you got the job. Oh, phew, right. that was close. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm heartbroken. First, the Wayne turns on me. Now you come on, man. What am I doing in life? Um, I mean. Yes. You know what? I take back. You don't look like Tom Holland. Forget uh, Tom Welland. Forget about it. Forget it. Man, he looks like me. He wishes he looked like me. That's true. That's Other true. way around. But, yeah, right. Well, you still got youth on your side, you know. So <laughs> true that. Age but, just know, a number, Jonathan, my friend. Yeah, but Jonathan, it's been it's been a pleasure to have you on. Like I said, it's, we're going on an hour <clears> and a half, and I'm sure if you ever want to come back, and we'll have you on. But you know, where can people find you? You know, where can people, if they interested in uh, personal training services, you know, learning your story, uh, connecting with you, where can people find you? Um, so the biggest, uh, I'm probably most active on Instagram. It's just Jonathan Nizel, first and last name. Uh, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube is all Jonathan Nizel. My uh, Facebook page is Jonathan Nizel Official, and my website is Jonathan Nizel Official. And my Instagram has all the links to you know, all the podcasts I've been on as well as my, uh, my website and stuff like that. I love, I love connecting with people. I love learning from people. You know, I love how to continue the conversation. A lot of times I'll do podcasts and people will, you know, pop up and tell me stuff that they do to help with their mental health or their addiction and stuff like that. And I love, I love that. I love to continue to learn and grow. And like I said, I don't think I have it all figured out. I do not have all the answers. I'm just trying to get through life like everybody else is. And yeah, I, I, uh, I love hearing from people and connecting. So reach out, slide my DMs. <laughs> not, <laughs> not like Diddy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, more power to you. Know, if he's having fun, but as long as nobody gets hurt, I mean, hey, everybody do as they please, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else. Like, do as you please. Hey, if you want to party with John, uh, I, I love Pete Diddy jokes. <laughs> yeah, you better not like tag this, like, hey, Jay Diddy's on the. <laughs> Hey, you know, you got to go viral, man. You got to go viral, you know? Yeah, there's there is such a thing as bad press. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> but, Jonathan, you know, it, it's been a pleasure to have you on. Uh, and I'm sure I'm looking forward to have you on again soon. And I, like I always say, a helping hand is a better hand. And it's not just a slogan. It's a way of life. And I think Jonathan in this episode has proved that, you know, be be sure to help somebody else because you never know when you'll need help, too. So, you know, I'm the most charismatic man. That's Jonathan Nizel. And, you know, we're, we're going to see you in the next episode. Check out Jonathan. His website is amazing. I got the pleasure of checking everything out. You know, he, he he's doing his thing, and he's showing the world that you can bounce back from adversity. And so I welcome you to do the same. 
You don't gotta go. You don't gotta go home, but you can't stay here. We'll see you later.